Nuclear Hot Seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear Hot Seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear Hot Seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but the activists are linking. Nuclear Hot Seat, it's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, happy anniversary to all of us. Well, not happy, because we're coming up on the first anniversary of the leak of plutonium-contaminated nuclear weapons waste at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site, in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Now, nearly one year later, the site is still closed. Don Hancock, Executive Director of Southwest Nuclear Information Center, gives us a thorough update on what has and hasn't happened to there and what the future may hold for this radiation-riddled nuclear waste dump. Plus, the ever-popular features, numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, a very sad John Stewart outreach, and enough nuclear information to further depress depressed hipsters everywhere. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday. February 10, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Genuine nuclear expert Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education cites recent scientific studies from Japan that show that 75% of the radiation created by the meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi were released more than five days after the catastrophe began. This shows that total gaseous and liquid radioactive releases from the meltdown exceed the radiation released during and after the Chernobyl meltdown. And the radiation releases aren't over yet because radioactivity continues to bleed into the Pacific Ocean. Government experts from Idaho National Laboratory Sites Environmental Surveillance Education and Research Program reported that Three of Fukushima Daiichi's reactor cores overheated and melted, releasing hydrogen gas and fission products into their reactor containment structures. In addition, it is possible that the large hydrogen explosion in Unit 3 may have damaged stored spent fuel and caused the release of additional radioactive material. So Nuclear Hot Seat asks, When will mainstream media stop saying that Fukushima is the worst accident since Chernobyl and recognize and admit the fact that it is the worst nuclear accident, the worst industrial accident ever? I'm not holding my breath. The Associated Press reports that computer simulations indicate that all of the fuel rods in the Unit 1 reactor probably melted and fell to the bottom of the containment chamber. But until now, there has been no way of confirming that. Nobody knows what state these deadly materials are in. Now, TEPCO has announced that a new robot developed by Hitachi will be able to enter Unit 1 through a steel pipe, take digital images, and measure radiation levels. After that, engineers will have to design another robot or set of robots to do the next phase of work. A Hitachi spokesmodel said, this is a step-by-step process. One step at a time, and yes, indeed, you are powerless. According to Fukushima Diary, on the 27th of January, TEPCO announced that they measured 31 million becquerels per cubic meter of strontium-90 in the sampling point closest to Reactor 2. This is 10% higher than the previous record. And how is this playing out in the food chain? A Fukushima citizen measured over 29 becquerels per kilogram of cesium-134 and 137 in pig excrement. That means that the pork in that pig has a serious amount of internal exposure. But even if it's too much for Japan, 
they can always ship it over here to the United States, where we allow 12 times more radiation in our food than they do in Japan. And we're getting first signs that there is a growing awareness in mainstream media that Fukushima may be as bad as some of us have been saying all along. The Economist, a magazine based in London, came out with an article on Fukushima entitled Mission Impossible, an Industrial Cleanup Without Precedent. Being The Economist, they crunch the numbers and come up with a potential cost over the next decade of up to 168 and three quarters billion dollars that will need to be spent on this cleanup, and there's no telling how much more it will cost after that. Where there's fire, there's smoke, and none of it is good news for those of us who wish to avoid radionuclides. On Nuclear Hot Seat, we've previously covered the burning of decontaminated waste in Japan, which is re-releasing the radionuclides into the air as smoke and through the dumping of the leftover ash into Tokyo Bay and the Pacific Ocean. On a smaller but more personal level, over three times the radiation level as background has been detected in incense sticks used for funerals in Japan. A Japanese citizen with radiation monitoring equipment posted this information on Twitter on February 7th. And when the information was provided to the funeral home where the incense sticks were taken from, the problem was taken seriously immediately. In Ukraine, scientists have long feared that forest fires could send leftover radiation from the explosion at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant back into the atmosphere as radioactive leaves and other dead and dry plant material burn up traces of cesium wafting skyward in the plumes of smoke. Now, a new study confirms these fears, suggesting forest fires can and will enable radiation to accumulate in clouds and travel across eastern Europe. That's the problem we faced here in the U.S. back in June of 2011, when the Las Conchas fire threatened the Los Alamos National Laboratory, which had in its early years dumped radioactive waste material in the forest, gullies, and arroyos around it. The fear at the time was the smoke from the fires burning through these areas would release radionuclides into the environment all over again. That's the problem that was faced and faced down when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service recently announced that they were going to have controlled burns at Rocky Flats in Colorado, where the land is contaminated with plutonium and other radionuclides left over from the Manhattan Project and nuclear weapons manufacturing. But public outcry has successfully turned around the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and the U.S. Department of Energy, which had approved this controlled burn. Fish and wildlife officials said that they would have to turn to another option this year to address the growing potential for uncontrolled wildfire and the spread of invasive weeds. Their options include spraying chemicals to kill weeds, mowing, or letting goats or cows graze on the grasslands. I vote for goats. Snowstorms in the eastern part of the United States caused safety equipment at Zion Nuclear Plant in Illinois to fail to function as design. And as regards the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant in Plymouth, Massachusetts, State Senator Daniel Wolf, a Democrat, pointed out, had there been a need for implementing the emergency response plans, the town of Plymouth and surrounding area roads were impassable, with drifting snow several feet deep. It would have been impossible for any evacuation in these conditions. That's it, Pilgrim. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. Lamar Alexander, the senior U.S. senator from Tennessee, made a speech in front of the U.S. Nuclear Energy Institute where he said that the U.S. without nuclear was unthinkable. He told the attendees at the NEI, which bills itself as the policy organization of the nuclear energy and technologies industry, that the prospect of a USA without any nuclear power was, quote, a real threat to our way of life. 
What the senior senator from Tennessee seems to have ignored, or perhaps he wasn't aware of the fact, is that Boom Dam in Piney Flats, Tennessee, is leaking, seeping, and developing at least one sinkhole, which has led engineers to say that there are stability issues with the dam. So what's that got to do with nuclear? Only that Boone Dam is upstream from seven different nuclear sites, including Browns Ferry, Sequoia, and Watts Bar. Whee! Head for the hills! The dam's busted! Takes on a whole new meaning when the target may be nuclear. If we don't get rid of nuclear reactors voluntarily, Ma Nature may take care of it for us. And the nuclear aftermath of a breakdown of Boone Dam is what would really be unthinkable. And that's why, Senator Lamar Alexander from Tennessee, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none nuts of the week. And two international stories about how the U.S. is not wearing a nuclear white hat. A Marshall Islands nuclear disarmament lawsuit against the United States was dismissed on Wednesday, February 4th, by San Francisco-based federal judge Jeffrey White. The Marshall Islands government claimed that the U.S. had breached its obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty by allegedly failing to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures for nuclear disarmament. Well, yeah. And a Swiss-led European Union initiative to amend and strengthen international reactor safety standards in a post-Fukushima world was blunted by the United States delegation to the International Atomic Energy Agency's Convention on Nuclear Safety. The U.S. is recognized as the leading opponent to upgrading international nuclear safety standards to prevent the next nuclear meltdown. Because, of course, we all know how money is a guaranteed shield against nuclear radiation. We'll have some really good links up on the website this week. One is an article on radon's deadly connection with uranium mining as seen from the Navajo Nation, which has been so hard hit and negatively impacted by uranium mining on native tribal lands. There will also be a link to an article from Spiegel, a German publication, an excellent article on the USS Reagan sailors that covers the story in brilliant detail from an international perspective. And former nuclear hot seat interviewee Dennis Riches, who lives in Japan, has written a compelling article, Nuclear Horror Stories from Fukushima Daiichi to Kazakhstan. He starts out by decrying, quote, alarmism and hyperbole, end quote, in talking about the tragedy, and goes on to take us on a journey through just a few of the industrial accidents and atrocities that have happened that hold within them echoes of what is going on now at Fukushima. Three links, three stories. Man, there is no end to the information out there about nuclear. We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first... A reminder that my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond, is available on Amazon Kindle. It's the story of what it was like to be one mile away from a nuclear accident as it was happening, with no guarantee that I would live to see the other side of it, let alone live long enough to be doing nuclear hot seat these days. It includes a glimpse at the Cold War propaganda that we faced back then about nuclear and radiation, how it was possible to ignore Chernobyl, and what it took to turn around and face nuclear and decide to do something about it. And, well, if you've been listening to the show, you know that it led to this. Yes, I Glow in the Dark is available at a ridiculously low price on Amazon Kindle and can be played on any digital device. So go check it out. There's an excerpt on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, or a sample chapter available on Amazon. As we go into this week's featured interview, here's a little recent history review. Last year, on February 5th, 
a truck fire underground at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site near Carlsbad, New Mexico, shut the site down for an investigation. Only nine days later, on Valentine's Day 2014, the site experienced what is still an unexplained event. Some would call it an explosion. It breached containment of one of the 55-gallon drums of plutonium-contaminated nuclear weapons waste that had been shipped to WIP from Los Alamos National Laboratory. This accident released high levels of radiation, including plutonium and americium. It contaminated 8,000 feet of the underground, and some of these deadly radionuclides made their way up and out into the environment. Though we, the people who paid for this nuke dump with our tax dollars, were promised that WIP would function safely for 10,000 years, it imploded 9,985 years ahead of schedule and has been closed ever since. I don't expect there's going to be a refund on any of those tax dollars. To find out what's happening at WIP one year in, Nuclear Hot Seat again reached out to Don Hancock, Executive Director of Southwest Information and Research Center, a nuclear watchdog group headquartered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Don has been a reliable source on all things WIP for this show, and once again, he did not disappoint. Don Hancock, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. What, if anything new, is known about what caused the Valentine's Day 2014 accident at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant? Essentially nothing new is known. The Department of Energy and its contractors have been looking at pictures, taking videos of Panel 7, Room 7, the area that the radiation leak occurred, to see if they can find more than the one drum that we've had pictures of since last May leaking waste and radioactivity. But at this point, we don't know. My expectation is sometime within the next month, this internal DOE accident investigation board, as they call it, will issue a report in which they will claim that they know the cause or causes. But I don't have a great deal of confidence in that for two reasons. One is it's DOE investigating itself. And two, since they haven't really gotten to and can't really analyze the one or more containers that have leaked, at best they're going to have circumstantial evidence as opposed to definitive truth. What progress has been made in the recovery process? You speak about we only have the one set of pictures. How close have workers been able to get? Well, there are workers that are going into the underground. There are less than every day, but frequently there are workers that are going into the contaminated area, and that contaminated area is more than 8,000 feet of underground tunnels. And when workers go into any of that 8,000-foot area, they have to be wearing respirators and full personal protective equipment looking much like pictures that people have seen of Ebola workers. But a smaller number of workers have actually been in this Room 7, Panel 7, the highest radioactive area where the release came from, to take these videos that we've talked about. So they're physically in very close proximity. The workers that are in that room are in physically very close proximity. What we've come to know, and the Department of Energy and its contractors are extremely slow in terms of putting out the data that I and other people have been asking for in terms of the exact amounts of contamination that they're measuring in different parts of the underground. But with what we know at this point, the contamination is much more broadly spread than what initially was disclosed, and troublingly, it is more widespread than what it should be if the ventilation system in the underground was working correctly. From the beginning, they've always said 
the ventilation system, the filtration system worked fine, and so that kept a lot of the radiation that's coming out of the mine from going out into the general environment because it went through the filters on the surface. But they also tried to say, you know, that helped contain it in the underground. And whether from the initial release or continuing movement of the radionuclides underground, we now know from the sampling that they're doing that there is contamination literally hundreds of feet away and supposedly upwind from the areas that the contamination occurred. Is this all confined to the underground, or you're talking about radiation on the ground in the atmosphere? No, we're talking about radiation in the underground. This more than 8,000 feet of contaminated tunnels is all in the underground. There have not been, in terms of the sampling that's been done on the surface, there haven't been any significant increases or new spots of radioactivity found on the surface in the last several months. But there was the initial release that right. put plutonium and americium into the environment. Correct, yes. On February 15th, there was radioactivity that ended up being detected when the filters were removed on February 19th, and subsequently there has been contamination detected on the surface, but not in any significant levels for the last several months on the surface. Taking a slight step to the side, there seems to be some ongoing confusion about the nature of the waste stored at WIP. It's transuranic waste, which I've seen variously described as low-level or mid-level. But considering that there is plutonium and americium in there, and I have read reports that said that plutonium contaminates 90% of the stored material, wouldn't it be more accurate to call it high-level waste or simply plutonium-contaminated nuclear weapons waste? I like the second term, and I use something similar to that myself. Transuranic waste is plutonium-contaminated waste from manufacturing nuclear bombs. The reason I do not call it high-level waste is because the legal and technical definition of high-level waste do not include this kind of waste. There is high-level waste that comes from producing nuclear bombs, but that waste is not coming to WIP and is actually legally prohibited from coming to WIP. So that's why I don't call it high-level waste. It is definitely not low-level waste. Low-level waste, in fact, is also legally excluded from being brought to the WIP site. In some other parts of the world, for example, in Canada, this would be called intermediate-level waste because of the nature of its radioactivity. Plutonium is highly dangerous if it gets in your body, if you inhale it or ingest it. Plutonium by itself, as long as it's not going critical, i.e. blowing up, doesn't have a lot of gamma penetrating radiation that can do the sort of damage to people that high-level waste and especially cesium and strontium in high-level waste can do to people. So going back to the workers who are underground and actually working in the contaminated area, what limits are there on their access in terms of either time they can spend there or a level of radiation exposure? There are protocols, written protocols, that are developed to govern that issue in terms of how long they can stay underground and if radiation detection goes to certain levels, they have to immediately leave. Those are pretty regularly being changed and updated, so the Department of Energy and its contractors are not routinely making those protocols and those limits available to the public. On the one hand. On the other hand, they have, and I talked to, I was in Carlsbad about three weeks ago at a technical meeting, and I've since talked on the phone to the WIP project manager about some of these issues, which is, of course, not as good as the kind of detail we'd like to have. But before workers can go into any of the contaminated areas, other workers in full protective equipment who have radiation detection monitoring equipment with them have to go in to check to see what's happening. There are also additional continuous air monitors, radiation monitors in the underground 
as opposed to what there were at the time of the release last Valentine's Day. There are higher levels of protection, and as I say, the fact that workers are going in with protective equipment and respirators is a good thing from my standpoint. The things I am concerned about, and I raise these issues regularly, with the site, again, I use the comparison of Ebola workers. When you see pictures of Ebola workers, uh, health workers treating Ebola patients with their full equipment, the way it's determined whether they are contaminated or not is to test them. And fortunately, in most cases, Ebola workers wearing the equipment tested negative and they didn't get Ebola. But as we know, both in the U.S. and in Africa, there have been a smaller number of workers even wearing full equipment who were contaminated. But the way you know they were contaminated is you test them. So for the WIP workers, the way we would know for sure that they haven't been contaminated is to do testing, which in this case means bioassay, fecal and urine sampling of those workers. That is not being done. I'm constantly assured that's being done on a random basis of some of the workers in the underground. But what I would like to see is testing of all the workers on a regular basis to determine whether or not they're being they've gotten contaminated, gotten this internal contamination or not. Speaking of workers and internal contamination, there were immediately after the accident 22 workers who had confirmed results that they had been internally contaminated with radiation. I checked back about them at the time we do speak. Has there been any updated information on the health status of those workers and whether they've gotten their second opinions whether there has been anything done on their behalf. They ask those questions all the time, and but the answers are the same as I have gotten for about the last six months, which is because DOE estimates that each of those 22 workers received less than 10 millirem of internal exposure, they are not being treated. I have not gotten second opinions unless the worker themselves have paid money out of their own pocket to travel to some place and to see a specialist to get that kind of second opinion because the insurance policies that these workers have do not cover such a second opinion because they don't believe, DOE and the contractor don't believe they've got any significant exposure. I have asked the question, are all the 22 workers on the job or not? And the general answer I get is yes, they are on the job. But as I say, am I satisfied with that? No. And I'm hoping in my own mind, and I appreciate your raising it, and I try to raise it publicly and privately to encourage workers to get more checking, and especially if they start developing anything that could be called symptoms, respiratory kinds of symptoms to get checking. I guess the other thing to just say is what happens when you inhale plutonium is that you're going to get lung cancers. But as people in general know, and even smokers know, the fact that you get lung cancer doesn't mean that the symptoms uh, are present or that the cancer can even be detected right away. So one of the problems is some of these workers that could develop, for example, lung cancers without very good specialists and very good testing, it might not be apparent that that was the case right now. It sounds like they are not making allowances for the difference between internal and external radiation. External radiation being akin to standing by a nice hot campfire and warming your hands, whereas internal contamination would be swallowing a hot coal. And internal contamination means that these workers have the equivalent of having swallowed the hot coal. Also, hard tumors can take between 12 to 15 years to develop in the body, even with direct plutonium contamination. So we're looking at a tremendous time gap between cause and effect, which, of course, has built-in deniability to the site. Yes, that's right. And as we've talked about, the fact that they're not being tested further and that some but not all of the workers that are going into the contaminated area in the underground now are not being tested 
some are being tested, some are not being tested, you know, increases the concern of this kind of A, contamination, but B, delayed obvious effect of the contamination. So these are continuing problems insofar as a lot of cases it's the same workers going into the contaminated area day after day. It's even more of a concern because over time, quote unquote, little bit of internal contamination tomorrow and a little bit more internal contamination in a month becomes even more concerning. And so, as I say, I, I agree and raise these questions myself constantly that there are problems. The other thing to just say, remember that the Department of Energy and the contractor in checking the 22 workers at the site on February and 14th and 15th, all of that testing failed to detect that those 22 workers had been contaminated. So, this is an additional reason why they need to improve the testing that they're doing and improve on the procedures, the protocols that they're using. Back to what's happening in the actual site. In getting the photos and the videos, and we do have a brief video that will be posted up on the website under this episode, number 190, but in getting those videos and pictures, I have to say that the WIP underground looks kind of like a really cluttered garage with things stacked on top of each other. There isn't anything orderly. There don't seem to be any aisles through the barrel. How are they able to access, or how well are they able to access the actual container that leaked and check the area around it? And what do they have to do in order to get those pictures and videos? So they had constructed for the underground a, for lack of a better term, a 90-foot long boom where cameras can run along. If people who see professional football games, for example, see cameras that are running along in that just rather than a metal boom, it's more of a line. But cameras being able to run and to take pictures over a 90-foot area, that that technology exists. And that that's what they were doing in much of January and uh, the first few days of February trying to do that. They also, on that boom, have the capability of raising it and lowering it. In other words, the boom is 12 feet or so above the ground, but they have cables so that the camera can descend from 12 feet and go all the way down to the floor and then back up. So the goal was to get uh, as many pictures as possible of as many of the 258 containers that are in that area as possible. We haven't seen the pictures yet, the videos, so how good the pictures are, how many of those containers they actually have good views of, it remains to be seen. But one point that is important to emphasize is no matter how good the camera was, there's no way they would have seen all of the 258 containers because, for example, the 55-gallon drums are packaged in seven together, uh, one in the middle and then seven around it, and then those seven stacked on top of another seven. So you can just from that verbal picture, you can understand if you're that drum in the middle even on the top, you can't see anything really of it, and the 55-gallon drum in the middle of the stack below it, you can't see at all. So if the project went as it was supposed to, most, the large majority of the 258 containers, they will have some number of pictures of, but there will be a few of the containers that they will have no pictures of. Um, so, as I say, it remains to be seen uh, how good that has. The other thing that they've tried to do, both in May and subsequent, and presumably in this last few weeks, is they've also, in addition to the cameras, they've put sampling swipes on booms to actually take swipes to kind of get samples of the particular radioactivity that are in the drum that's breached and, of course, because it's spewed out in other places. So, again, 
hopefully they have gotten good pictures and more sampling data. So far, essentially none of it have been made publicly available. So how well they have done and how well independent people looking at the pictures and information they've developed will think they've done is something that remains to be seen over the next few months. When are the pictures or the videos scheduled to be released so that they can be examined by those outside of this inner circle? They have provided no specific target schedule to release them. What has generally been said is the internal DOE investigation, this accident investigation board, will release some or all of those videos when they release their written report that they're in the process of doing, and the video part is part of the evidence they were trying to gather for their report. That report was supposed to be out long before now. It's been intimated to me, and I have sort of assumed that sometime three to six weeks after the end of the picture taking would be when the report would come out and hopefully then the videos would come out. Since the videos got finished last week, why then sometime late February, early to mid-March is presumably when the report and the videos will come out, but that, again, is totally up to the Department of Energy in terms of when that information is released. Speaking of the Department of Energy, despite all of the unknowns about the radiation leak and exactly what happened, Energy Secretary Mone several months ago was in Carlsbad for one of the town meetings, and he announced that the site was expected to be back in operation in, I believe at that time he said, three years. How realistic is that assessment? Not realistic at all, in my view. But the public should understand two things. One is regardless of not knowing the cause, not knowing how to prevent it in the future, not knowing how to really deal with this kind of contaminated environment, the federal government is going to spend hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, trying to get the facility reopened. So that's a questionable judgment in its own right. In terms of the schedule, the meeting that I was at in Carlsbad on January 14th was basically to talk in some detail about the schedule and to some extent the cost of what it would take to get reopened. And it was clear at that meeting and then last Monday when the Obama administration budget came out, it was clear that nobody really has a good estimate of the time frame and the cost to get it reopened. Specifically, the budget released last Monday explicitly said, and this is a direct quote, it is too early to estimate the total cost of reopening WIP to once again receive shipments of transuranic waste. So that's the Obama administration telling Congress that we don't know how much it's going to cost and we don't know how long it's going to take because those two things to some extent are tied together. So that's something that people should know. In the recovery plan that Secretary Moniz talked about when he was there in August of 2014, the actual document that he was talking about about the schedule was released on September 30th. That recovery plan, as it's called, didn't really have a lot of dates in it, but the first date that was in it was something to be accomplished by December 31 of 2014, in other words, more than a month ago. That was the initial closure of Panel 6, the last full panel set of rooms where waste was in place before this new Panel 7 was started. So that initial closure was supposed to be done by December 31st. It is not done. In fact, effectively hasn't been started for two primary reasons. One is the levels of contamination that we've been talking about. They had originally hoped and thought that workers would be able to go there without using protective equipment because there would be little or no contamination. That's wrong. There is contamination there. And then the second problem is the concern about the ceiling collapsing when workers are there trying to close it up, uh, similar to what happened just a few hundred feet away. Uh, at the entrance of Panel 3, one of the panels that was used years ago, where there was several tons of salt that collapsed, fell off of the ceiling and collapsed, 
and there is concern that a similar thing could happen at panel six, either in terms of closing it up or my additional concern, which again I've raised with the DOE officials, is you could have a ceiling collapse in room one of panel six where you have literally thousands of containers and if the ceiling collapsed on some of those containers, you could have an additional radiation release in the underground, and since they don't have the initial closure, these bulkheads up yet, a collapse in room one could send radiation into other parts of the mine as well. That, in addition to the radiation problem, that's a physical collapse problem that workers going into that area have to be aware of, and so before you can go in to seal it up, you're first going to have to send workers in to put rock bolts in and do some other things to try to stabilize things to try to ensure that the ceiling wouldn't be collapsing. I understand that that kind of maintenance work used to be ongoing so that there was less of a chance of any kind of collapse happening, but that since last February 14th, they've not been able to do the maintenance with the bolts into the ceiling to make sure that there aren't any further collapses. Yeah, that's correct. Actually, they haven't been able to do bolting since February 5th because, remember, before the Valentine's Day radiation release, there was a fire on February 5th, so the facility has effectively been closed down since February 5th. So it's, we're now more than a year if it's being closed down. And so between February 5th and November, they were unable to do any rock bolting. Since November, they've been doing rock bolting primarily in the part of the facility, the northern part of the underground mine with where they say there is no detectable radiation contamination to shore those up, but they are now in the last week or so trying to start going in and doing bolting in some of the contaminated area, including moving toward and getting to this panel six area that we talked about. So yes, they will have to do both ongoing and the catch up bolting for a long period of time. and as we've discussed, until you get the ceilings in better places in a number of areas of the contaminated part of the mine, uh, you can't really do other things there. The town meetings are still being held the first Thursday of every month to purportedly update reporters and members of the community as to what's actually going on on the site. Has there been any new information for these times? And how involved is the community in attending, or have they really burned out on it? There's some significant frustration expressed by community people at those meetings and frustration expressed by people who are online that there isn't a lot of information given. There is still interest in the community about what's going on, and sometimes more people show up and sometimes fewer people show up. I think for a lot of local people, they're hopeful that, you know, what happened a year ago won't happen again and people will keep their jobs and everything's going to be fine, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a certain amount of that. There's a certain amount of people feeling like, you know, well, it is going to be reopened and everything's going to be fine. Um, and then there are a number of people who are concerned about the lack of information and concerned that since they are unwilling to tell a lot of things that the situation, in fact, could be worse than what they're being led to believe. But the town hall meetings, the primary people who speak at these meetings are the Department of Energy and Nuclear Waste Partnership officials. So they typically do a lot of what I call happy talk, which is even if they have to talk about things that are not perfect, they always want to talk about it in ways that, you know, things are okay, even when they're bad, they're not as bad as expected, and terms like that, which are not really helpful since they don't say in advance what they expect, and so there's no way to judge whether what happens is less or greater than the expectations. That's not sufficient. The reason for this longer, more detailed meeting on January 14th was to try to address some aspects of things, and I appreciated that meeting happening. 
We have had promises that there are going to be more of those longer, more detailed, more interactive meetings happening, but we'll see. With the first anniversary coming up, there are obviously going to be news stories because the news media can count up to one year in terms of anniversary coverage, and then they usually skip to number five. But you should have a number of stories coming out focusing on the one-year anniversary. Are you aware of any such stories being prepared, and have there been reporters talking to you to prepare themselves for it? I am presuming, as you just said, that there will be a number of stories so I've talked to dozens of reporters over the last year about WIMP. I know that some of the local New Mexico-based papers in Carlsbad, Albuquerque, and Santa Fe, who've done some ongoing coverage and are continuing to cover and are looking at one-year kinds of things, in terms of some of the more national media like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and television and radio outlets, I have not heard recently that any of those people are specifically working on a one-year anniversary story. Several of them have talked to me about they want to do some reporting when this Accident Investigation Board report comes out that we've talked about, but that's not going to be until after the one-year anniversary. So I'm, I'm not sure how much coverage there's going to be. I certainly think there should be more than what there is, but New Mexico is a long ways away from the media centers of the country. Where does this go from here? Among the things that's going to be going on, I, for example, am in March going to be in Idaho and South Carolina, two of the places where there is waste stored that was supposed to have been coming to WIP for the last year and is not and has not been and is not going to be coming for some time in the future to talk to folks in those places about giving them a little more information and perspective about what's going on and talking about the kinds of things people around Department of Energy weapons facilities that thought they were going to be shipping their waste to WIP and now have not for the last year and won't for some years into the future, what the implications are, what should be done to protect workers and public health and the environment around those places. So those are things that should happen for people who are not around those facilities. Among the questions people need to pay attention to are how much money you as a federal taxpayer are being asked to spend. Um, unfortunately, the contractors um, that run WIP are getting paid more to not handle waste at WIP than they were when they were handling waste at WIP. So that's an issue. The Obama budget request that was released last Monday, February 2nd, that mentioned that they didn't know what the cost and how long it would take to reopen WIP is still asking for another $248 million for the next federal fiscal year for WIP, which, again, is more than WIP had ever received before this current year. So, as I say, to me, there are real questions that people should be asking, for example, to their Congress senators of why are we putting more money into the facility when it's not operating than we did when it was, and is this actually a good use of money because it may be a long time and maybe not ever before the facility can reopen, and shouldn't we know more about what's going on before we keep putting more money into it? John, this is obviously a story that's not going away, and we look forward to talking with you in the future and getting more of your extremely articulate and well-informed updates for the listeners. Thank you. Appreciate your interest in uh, getting some of the message out. So thank you. That was Don Hancock, Executive Director of the Southwest Information and Research Center, a nuclear watchdog group headquartered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. As was mentioned in that interview, Valentine's Day is coming up. So this year, instead of a nuclear accident, how about giving a love offering to Nuclear Hot Seat? If you're a regular listener, you know that I am on my way the end of this month to go to New York to cover Dr. Helen Caldicott's symposium on the dynamics of possible nuclear extinction. What a lighthearted way to spend the weekend. My goal, of course 
is to bring all of you with me so that you hear more and experience more than you can get over the live stream of this event. I want to take you up close and personal with the presenters, the other activists, capture the excitement of this event and the sense of possibility that comes when such minds and such hearts come together in the cause of shutting down nuclear everywhere. In order to do that, I have been raising funds, and yes, thank you, many of you have been very generous towards me, so now I'm in the final stages of raising the funds necessary to cover my expenses and really do the bang-up job that you've come to expect from this program. So take a moment and go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the homepage to the big red well, we would like to have made it a heart, but let's just say it still looks like the same donate button. Click on it, do what you can, and know that your support is helping me support you in getting the best, most cutting-edge information on all things anti-nuclear. And of course, as always, you have my thanks and my genuine gratitude. John Stewart, no, tell me it ain't so. You're retiring sometime this year? You just announced it today, but John, Bobby, you and I, you and me, we have a rendezvous with fate, with destiny, with kismet. I'm supposed to be your nuclear pundit, remember? we got to work this thing out. Look, we can do counseling, some therapy. It doesn't have to be the end. Look, I'm going to be at your show on Monday, March 2. I do have the pre-tickets. I'll stand in line, and trust me, I will get in. So while I'm there, we're going to work it out. Pencil me in. Even better, put it in ink. We will make this work, John. Activist shout-out. Again, my thanks to Deun Renard for saving my bacon last week. I'll explain about that in a few moments. Project Censored, the KPFA-produced program on news that didn't make the news, this Friday has a special program. It's on Friday the 13th, always a good luck day. It features Cindy Falker of Beyond Nuclear and Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education talking about all the latest information from Fukushima. It's going to be information-packed, fact-based, and really terrific. The show goes out live this Friday at 1 o'clock Pacific time, and after that, it's syndicated around the country and available at the website, projectcensored.org. And Myla Reason has created another short video, this time with Harvey Wasserman bringing us information on Davis Bessie. What a dump. No, not Davis Betty. Davis Bessie. So, Betty, your sentiments are completely accurate when it comes to that nuclear reactor. Myla's video is available on YouTube, and we're also linking to it on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 190. And I'm looking for someone or some ones to help get the Don Hancock interview to radio stations in New Mexico in time to be a source for their WIP anniversary shows. They should only decide to produce one. If someone has about an hour or so to help get it out, that would be terrific. I can explain the whole thing to you and give you the text to send. Email me if you're interested at info at nuclearhotseat.com. Here's today's final thought, which I have alluded to several times in this podcast. For last week's show, I discovered an outrageously numbnuts item. So good, I couldn't have made it up. I checked back, did my research, and found confirmation that the article was true. So I thought. So I recorded it as a spectacular numbnuts of the week and posted the episode. And in the process, I accidentally fell for a hoax. The piece was a misstatement of fact, and the confirmation I thought I found, which I will admit that I scanned and didn't read closely enough, that article proved to be a very well-written satire piece. Just as I started posting this all over Facebook, the mistake was caught by our favorite anti-nuclear fox, 
Rainbow Warrior founder and researcher extraordinaire de Un Renard. I immediately broke the link to the recording, deleted all mention of the episode that I'd already posted, and I also posted an apology for the few American insomniacs and people elsewhere in the world who may have caught the original flawed version. Then I re-recorded, re-edited, and had the show up in corrected form by noon on Wednesday. It was a very close call that underscores once again how easy it is to slip on that nuclear banana peel, especially when it comes to believing information sourced from another language, another culture, and an intermediary source that may or may not be accurate. Hysteria and exaggeration on our part only undermine our credibility. As you may have noticed, I try to avoid it. So now, even more than before, I have tightened up my filters, slowed myself down even further, double and triple check my sources, and reach out to my contacts for their direct input because so many people know so much more than I do. I am dedicated to keeping Nuclear Hot Seat a reliable source of information, sarcasm, puns, and sound effects notwithstanding. If I make a mistake, I will admit to it and correct it as swiftly as possible. But this raises an issue for all of us. It's easy to fall into an echo chamber of misinformation. The nuclear situation worldwide is bad enough. Exaggeration, extreme pronouncements, passing along information without vetting it, all of that makes us prone to inaccuracies. And inaccuracies undermine our credibility with a skeptical, propagandized public. So let's work hard to keep our info flow based on the facts as we can best source them. If you see an item that is screamingly outrageous, no matter how delicious it would feel to pass it along, take a moment before you hit share. Maybe trace back the source. See what year it was posted. That's a big source of errors. Check it out for its accuracy preferably with a grain of salt. If it proves out, share away. If not, debunk and delete. And if that grain of salt you took it with happens to be sea salt, make certain you know from which sea it has been sourced and when. Because some of that stuff, I'm not saying it is, but it just might be radioactive. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, February 10, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, fairwinds.com, Radio VR, Associated Press, Wall Street Journal, wsj.com, economist.com, fukushima-diary.com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, TEPCO, upi.com, denverpost.com, tapecodtimes.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, mothballmillstone.org, nationalpost.com, Press Democrat, LA Times, Orange County Register, NBC, Nightly News, Yahoo News, Global News of Canada, Asian Pacific Post, Beyond New Nuclear.org, Nears.org, Mvariety.com, Indian Country Today Media Network.com. That's got to rank as one of the longest URLs we've had. Spiegel.de, MintPressNews.com, those pro nuclear stumble bums at World Nuclear News, and the nimble minded, ever vigilant Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. You can subscribe on iTunes, where you can also find our archive, or just check us out on the website NuclearHotSeat.com. You can search for subject matter and by title. Our YouTube channel carries the show courtesy of the support of Joni Ray. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, Reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. 
Nuclear Hot Seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear Hot Seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear Hot Seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear Hot Seat. It's the bomb.